Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Come right on in, friends. Let's have a cup of tea and just have a good time together for the next few minutes. It's such a pleasure, such a privilege uh, to connect with you this way. You know, we used to say, uh, you know, to come into your home, but boy, we don't know where people are watching nowadays. A lot of people watch on their, tele their little telephone. Amazing stuff, but we are glad to be connected with you. And many of you have been with us for, for years, and we so appreciate your kindness. A lot of times it comes through in an email or a, a letter in the mail, and then um, we're always hearing from brand new people who just discovered homekeepers. And I'll tell you what we try to do. We try to give you any and every kind of uh, information that can be beneficial to you. And it might be something personal about your health, your money, your parenting, your marriage, uh, your relationship with the Lord, and, uh, you know, good food. And also I'd like to bring you the ministries that you might never hear of if somebody didn't bring them on TV. And uh, so that's why it's such, such a privilege to be part of this and to know that you're out there too. You hear a lot of stories today about, about the condition of the church. And one thing that's very sobering to me is the fact that uh, some young person could be raised in church all their life through high school. They go away to college and they kind of quit church altogether. That's very, very troubling. And so I have an expert today. His name is Pastor Alan White. He has worked with probably, I think I read about 1,500 churches, uh, you know, to help get a hold of why people don't come, why they drop out, and what you can do to keep them there because you're looking at someone who really believes in church life. I was raised in it. I wouldn't take anything for it. I believe in Sunday school. I believe in children's church. I believe in youth groups. I believe in youth retreats and Bible, uh, VBS, really believe in VBS. And parents, one of the best things you can ever do with your children is keep them in that church life. And so many are dropping out. And so I, I think our, my guest today, Pastor Alan White, he can give us some insight into this. And hopefully, I think his, his mission in life is try to, you know, make a correction. And then I'm going to join Stephanie. Don't you love Stephanie out there? We're going to make a quick ravioli and spinach soup. And I think the way women operate today, wearing so many hats, so many irons in the fire, that anything that says quick is uh, attractive to them. And so this one looks awfully good. When this program's over, I can assure you that's what I'm going to have for lunch. So uh, you might want to watch and see how we fix that. Before I join her, though, let me again just remind you, we are viewer supported and that's you. And uh, sometimes we offer product. And, I, you know, my, my favorite thing is that the Holy Spirit would put it on the hearts of viewers to do something to keep this program on the air. And um, whether it's big or small, the important thing is that we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, everything's taken care of. So information is coming up on your screen. I have a hunch. I'm telling you, I have a hunch. That there's a lot of people who have watched us for years and years, and uh, they have intended, intended to send an offering. Well, this is a good day to come through with that intention. And uh, most people use credit card or debit card. That's your 800 number right there. But if, like me, you don't do that hardly ever, you can use the homekeeper's address, box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. But I'm standing here shoulder to shoulder with a girl who does about everything online, right? True story. Because you're young. <laughs> and okay. I'll, I'll, bet you, I'll bet you're Alexis, her beautiful daughter, I'll bet she knows every kind of gadget, everything oh, yes. technical, and oh, she yes. teaches you. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. great-grandchildren who teach me. Yep. So, so. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't, you know, um, we'll come, I, I will come up with a recipe and you will say we've done it or Susan will say we've done it. I am so over that. <laughs> so if we repeat one, tough luck. We've done over 3,000 recipes. There aren't any other kinds, really. Yeah, because so, we have no to do apologies. simple. No, oh, no okay. apologies. Okay, so we're in Florida. It's the end of October and fall finally, finally hit this morning. I got out of the house. It was 68 degrees and I thought I was in heaven. Me too. So we're going crazy today with soup. 
Because that's what you do in fall. <laughs> yeah, and, and the last program we did, we did a hot apple hot cider. cider. We go crazy when we get I mean, below you get, 70. It'll be like three or four days. I'm breaking out some boots. I'm breaking out a scarf. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Okay, so. We're having a real cold front come in. Well, cold. Okay, <laughs> I'm. Um, She's cutting up some spinach. Spinach. I have some. It calls for chicken broth. I think I have vegetable broth. Uh-huh. Okay. And then I have some onion powder and some pepper. Now listen, this is one of those recipes where you can get the rotisserie chicken mm -hmm. on the weekend. Mm -hmm. You cut it up, you put it in baggies, you put it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. You could have this soup made in less than five minutes on a weeknight. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to help you make it super simple. Well, These and are the, cheese ravioli. The Just truth a bag is, of cheese ravioli. Uh, Stephanie does help people with this. And I, I just I'm wanna, not kidding. I appreciate after it. After I cook all day, I mean cook, after I work, work all day, mm -hmm. I don't want to go home and have to put together this dinner mm -hmm. that takes five pans and ten dishes, yeah. all these dishes. I just want something simple. This mm -hmm. is going to be your friend. Mm -hmm. Rotisserie chicken cut up. So that's chicken. It was and rotisserie chicken is so... So flavorful. Yep. I don't know how Or they... if you don't want a rotisserie chicken, I take um, chicken breasts. On yeah. Sunday, I throw a whole bunch of them in the oven, oven with a bunch of spices. Cut them up. Cut them up. Okay, this is spinach, and then I'll take what you cut up too. Okay. I mean, this is how simple this is. And this I, is it. I I eat an awful lot of this baby spinach. Uh, and it's just so yummy. Look at this. You and can, then we put we're gonna let that spinach cook down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then when we put it in the bowl, we're going to put a little Parmesan cheese on it for yeah, an extra and, um, la layer of flavor. Don't you just really get excited when you think, well, I'm so much older than you, but when you look back and, and you can see all of the helpful things. Oh, my gosh. Like, go buy a package of ravioli. What if you had to make those yeah, little things? we wouldn't be eating ravioli. We, no, we wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> <It's true. laughs> no, we would Never. not. Never. My grandmother used to make homemade pierogies. Yes. By the hundreds. And one of these days I want to just sit down and that's one thing I do want to do. I just want to make homemade pierogies. I didn't even know what a pierogi was and I have eight great grandchildren, but she taught me. We fixed one once, didn't we? We fixed a pierogi dish. A dish. Yeah. Okay. And it was one of the best things I ever ate in my whole entire mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Maybe we ought to pull that one out again for all those okay. who missed it. <laughs> That one you would not have to. So you want this to, you know, just to simmer for a little bit. So put it all together. You can do a few things at home once you get home, and then you're, and then it's all done. Yeah. Put some bread with it. Yummy bread. You know, you it's gotta, it's really true if you plan things. You oh, planning it's is your friend. save you a lot of lists are my friends. Just uh, this is parmesan. Oh my. Right. Look at that. Mm hmm. Put this one for you. Now it's kind of warm, so be careful. Yeah. I'll take a ravioli. You're mm -hmm. just taking the... Yeah, I'm just going to take the broth. Boy, we did it again. We're good. You can't even beat that. It took me less than three minutes oh. to put it together. That is I delicious. can't tell you how good that is. Now, I want the crew and everybody to know that when this show's over, Arthelene gets a bowl, and then you can have the rest of <laughs> it. Because you don't understand... Once, once the show's over, the food is like up for grabs, and people come running, okay, especially for something good. It's hysterical. Uh, what I think is funny, too, are the two or three back there that seldom come. But when we see, like, David. Then we know we've made something other, good. Yeah, they creep in here, yeah. So anyway, um, you want this This one. is good. You, you want really do one. want this, and so that information is coming up on your screen. And then uh, I want you to pay attention to my guest today because um, a lot of you are church leaders and so forth, and I think he can give you some great information. Stay with us. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. I am very happy to welcome to the program Alan White, and we went to the same Bible college. I don't know how many decades apart, but <laughs> it was the same one. Welcome. Thank you. It's welcome. great to be here. Now, you've, uh, you've been a pastor, associate pastor for a long time, and now you're in just a 
a little different, um, I would say tweak the ministry a little bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm helping other pastors with their ministries. Uh -huh. And what I'm finding is that I've actually been able to accomplish far more with God's help working with other churches than I was ever able to even accomplish myself. Mm -hmm. um, when did you, well, were you born and raised in a Christian home or did you have church life like I was talking I, about? I was, yeah, and uh, grew up in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, my parents have been a part of that church for a very long time. Been there many and, times. And uh, yeah, just came up like uh, with the rest of the group, yeah. Yeah, and um, so was there a point when you thought, man, this is a bit like a sieve. I mean, people are coming, they don't stay, or uh, we're losing them for a variety of reasons. And as you were thinking about that, what kind of answers did you get? You know, one of the things we discovered was our, our church started fairly small. This is when I was in a church in Northern California. And what we discovered was the church got to about 250 people. And the sense among our congregation was, well, we don't know everybody anymore. And then we got to 400, went to two services, and the feeling was more like, I can't even find the people that I know. And so one of the statements that I really took to heart actually came from Pastor Rick Warren when he said a church needs to grow larger and smaller at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we need to continue to reach out to the community and grow the services larger, lead more people to Christ. But at the same time, everybody doesn't have to know everybody, but it's important that everybody would know somebody. You know, um, I years ago, I interviewed Paul Youngie Cho, mm -hmm. who the great, biggest church in the world for a long time, maybe mm -hmm. it still is, in uh, Seoul, Korea. And um, the Lord gave this, I think this is when, way back then, you might have been quite young. Um, he was promoting the small groups and he mm -hmm. said the Lord gave that to him. Mm -hmm. He told me that. Because I, <laughs> I remember I asked him, do you use women in, in your church? Because you know that whole culture and we've even experienced that here. And he said, and he couldn't pronounce a R. Who should, I, I should talk. I can only speak one language and not too well. And I said, do you use women? And she said, yes. At, at first I was very reluctant. <laughs> but the Lord gave him this plan for small groups. And he takes it to the board. And he had a big board, you know, the thousands of people. And um, they said no. So he went back to the Lord. And the Lord told him, give it to the women. And the women created small groups. And, and then I, I've been there, 30,000 per service, you know, and there were still people sitting in the lobby uh, area and all. And I think that's where in, in our generation, in our lifetime, that small group idea came from. I, I think you're right. And just where it, it started with the idea that God planted in his heart and then came across the Pacific and the, most of the churches I've worked with, it, you know, across North America, it's really built on the model that, that was spoken to, to uh, Pastor Cho. You know, I remember a, a very large church here in Central Florida years ago. Um, they were, I think they were having four or five services. So they built this great big thing. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting from what I observed, a lot of the people lost community. Because mm -hmm. it was so big, maybe they were sitting over here or maybe they were, you know, they didn't go to that specific service. And um, if you don't have community, it's going to make a big difference. It really does. And I think as, as churches have gotten larger, you know, sometimes you sit there and you wonder, if I were to disappear from this church, would anybody notice? I could you know, answer that. Would anybody it care? It would be a no. But then you go the other way and you say, if I had a problem, if I needed somebody to talk to, who, who would I talk to? Who do I know? Mm -hmm. and, and that's yeah. why I think small groups are, are highly important. Absolutely. Yeah, and it can be many different things. You know, uh, if, if you're not a member of the choir, if you're not a member of Sunday school class, uh, they're not going to miss you. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way it is. So how did your work evolve from being a pastor or an associate or something with that kind of position into helping other pastors? Well, you know, I, I adopted some ideas, some great teachers and mentors and applied them to our church and they worked out really, really well. And I went from there to actually being on conference calls, working with other 
other pastors across the country and and beginning to see that you know I could coach them to success mm -hmm. and and begin to think then as you know as God was calling me to multiply my life in ministry that that could wasn't just to be in one single church mm -hmm. I've served, served two congregations um, over 27 years but uh, what I've discovered is even in the numbers are staggering and you know I, I don't want to I don't want it to come across as being you know bragging or anything but you know the Bible says let him who boasts boast in the Lord so this is what the Lord has done in the last six years churches I've worked with have started over 14,000 groups that have connected some 125,000 people which wow. is just staggering yeah but the truth is Alan we're both church kids a lot of pastors would have no idea how to start small groups. Mm -hmm. And that's where this ministry comes in. We're going to put his website up. And I know that there are Sunday school teachers watching and church leaders and so forth. I, I really advise you to take down that website um, and learn about how you can make your church grow. And that wouldn't, wouldn't just be a sieve. How, how about that younger generation? You know, it, there, there's a lot to be said about younger generations, and I know they want us to think that things are radically different. Obviously, our culture is radically different than it was before. But the bottom line is people are people, and we all have the same needs, and maybe things are said a little different way, or maybe things are, you know, in style, out of yeah. style, those sorts of things. But the yeah. bottom line is we all want to be accepted. We all want to be long. We all want that group of people in our life. We want people around us, our friends. Well, we can be our real selves. We don't feel like we have to put on. Mm -hmm. Every human being craves that relationship. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you suggest that a small group is around? What, what are we doing? Are, are we studying a book, which is a pretty good idea? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of ladies who do that, and there are great Christian books out there that you can get together and you read them and you come together. My daughters belong to uh, a Christian Bible study for 10 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. In fact, she's really moving up in it. But um, if it's not a book, if it's not a specific subject, why, are the, why is the group meeting? Well, I think it, a group should be built on a Bible study. And maybe I'm a little old school mm -hmm. that way, but I think it should have a purpose. I think mm -hmm. we should be opening up God's Word, sharing it, talking about how do we apply this to our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I was reading not too long ago, rereading the Great Commission for many, many, you know, many, many times that I've read it. And, the, and maybe it was the translation that I was reading it in, but what stood out to me was the last line that said, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Now, I know some vers versions will say, teaching them to observe. And I sat back and I thought, well, good grief. I have a master's in Christian education, and I'm looking at this, and what have we been doing? We've been teaching the commands, expecting that, oh, if people know Jesus' commands, they're just going to obey them. Mm -hmm. And yet, you, you look at the church, and you look at the world, and sometimes there's not a big mm -hmm. difference. And I thought, maybe we've missed it because we're teaching commands, but Jesus' instruction to us was teaching them to obey. Mm -hmm. So you're covering a passage with a group of people. The Word convicts you of something. You say, I need to change this. I need help with this. You know, even a verse like, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become mm -hmm. angry. I tell you what, if we put that verse in reverse, and we were quick to become angry, quick to speak, and slow to listen. I'd have that one down. But I thought, you know, that's not what God commands us to do, right? right? And so I need to try that out. But then, so part of it is I ask God to help. Because, I mean, as a believer, we have the power that raised Jesus from the dead that lives inside of us. Mm -hmm. But I also need a friend or a group of friends that are going to say, I know that verse touched you last week. So how did it go this week? Were you quick to listen? Were mm -hmm. you slow to speak? Were you slow to become angry? And I can say, well, these circumstances I did pretty good, and then this area, not so mm -hmm. good. And they say, you know what? You made good progress. Let's try it again. Mm -hmm. And this thing of to live it out, and it seems like such a simple thing, but it's almost like, it seems like a lot of people, they do their church thing, mm -hmm. and it's almost disconnected from the way they live their mm -hmm. lives. And I think that's unfortunate because God has so much for us. You know, we have such an interesting time right now in the United States. We have churches so big that uh, when I was growing up, you would never even imagine it. I mean, in the thousands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, several services. So uh, what, 
what size of church do you minister in? What size of church really needs help with this? It seems like that these big churches don't need any help in attendance. Mm -hmm. They might need in substance and that kind of thing. But well, and the thing is, you can look at a big, full auditorium and mm -hmm. think, "Wow, we're doing really, really great." But how many of these people came last week, and how many these people came a month ago or a year ago, and how many are new, and how many slipped out the back and nobody noticed? Mm -hmm. So I think even you know, in the the idea of closing the back door a little bit of having a relationship, having a connection of, I'm going to get lost in this big crowd. Mm -hmm. But if I have the people in my group that know me, they love me, they're going to speak the truth to me, that I can have that worship service and I can enjoy that, and then I can go to my group, to my friends, my mm -hmm. people, and spend time with them. Mm -hmm. And I, I worked with churches that were small. I worked with churches that were tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's interesting that when you get down to it, you have to scale it differently but, and staff it differently, but it's possible in every situation. Mm -hmm. I want to mention your book, uh, Exponential Groups, and who is this for? It's mainly for pastors and church leaders. Mm -hmm. And they can um, get it through the website, I'm sure. They can get it, yeah, they definitely can get it through website or, you know, other places online. Is it kind of a how-to book? It is. And, and what I wanted to do, I wanted to do two things. Oh, pastor, you ought to have this. Sunday <laughs> school teacher. Yeah, you know, one of the things I wanted to do with that book, first of all, I tell a lot of stories mm -hmm. because I enjoy stories mm -hmm. and I think stories capture people's attention. And the other thing was that even though I give principles, I wanted to show people that if all they ever did was bought that book, that it would be exactly mm -hmm. what they needed to do in order to start and, and sustain a successful small group ministry. I, and I believe, uh, I know the pastor's world very well. Mm -hmm. um, I think any pastor would benefit from this. Okay, now uh, the pastor, uh, whoever, he probably makes a decision, we're gonna have small groups here. Here's to me the, the big question. Every group needs a leader. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you define that leader? I mean, you can throw yourself open to lots of problems. Mm -hmm. You could. Mm -hmm. And so you have to supervise that. And so for every leader, you want someone with experience, with a certain level of maturity, that's gonna to help to coach that leader. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I do is actually, when you're starting out, I would have the church decide what all of the groups are going to study. Bingo, that's good. Yeah, and yeah. even to the point of pastors presenting their own teaching on video, and then writing some questions around that, mm -hmm. and their groups are studying something from their pastor. Mm -hmm. And that's more popular than, you know, buying something for mm -hmm. a church. But either way, if, if you, you know what the groups are studying, you know that it's good because either the pastor created it himself mm -hmm. or the pastor chose it. And then you have an experienced, mature person that's checking mm -hmm. in on them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, groups could go all different ways. And you, oh, don't, yeah. you don't want that. No. Um, you, you want it to be safe for everybody. You want it to be a good experience for everybody. But going back to how do you choose leaders, here's what I think. If you can get a group of friends together, you are a leader because leaders have influence. Mm -hmm. So if you get your group of friends together and you, your pastor or has recommended or produced mm -hmm. a curriculum with a video, you put in the video, you watch the video so you have the teaching, the leader doesn't have to be a Bible expert, mm -hmm. and then you, you discuss the questions mm -hmm. that are attached to that. And that's where you start. That's not where you stay. I want to see down the road people being able to open up mm -hmm. God's Word and rightly mm -hmm. dividing the Word of God and discussing it in their groups. But to make it an easy start, because most people don't think they're any kind of a leader. Well, that's exactly right, and which brings me to, uh, we're going to run out of time on this, but um, in my experience, you go tell women about Jesus and they're going to fall right to the cross and say, I need you. Men don't do that as quickly and as easily. Um, I would think getting men together in a small group would be a little bit different than getting a group of women who, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll volunteer. Uh, so do you have any ideas on how to make that a little smoother than? I think if you start out and you offer something that's short term, uh -huh. So they know it's not the rest of their life. They know, okay, I'm going to give this a try for six weeks. And in six weeks' time, they feel enough community that it might help them to stay. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing would be maybe to have 
some kind of a work project, some kind of an activity that they're going to do in addition to studying the word. Because guys like to do things. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be a good component as well to attract men. And then those men would get together and study the word as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any good stories of uh, outcome? You know, you, where you might have faced something that, hey, this looks impossible. Mm -hmm. And then God shows up and surprises you. Oh, they're, they're personal stories or with the church? or Yeah, uh, of the small groups. Oh, small it might groups. have been kind of tough getting it started, but it really bore a lot of fruit. Yeah, there, there are situations like that. People that you count on that you think, oh, they would be a perfect leader, and then for whatever reason they're busy or they're reluctant mm -hmm. or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And someone several years ago gave me this advice. They said, some of the most unlikely people will make some of your best leaders. And so I, I didn't say, oh, well, you know, if you seem like leadership material to me, I'm going to recruit you. I actually opened it up. And that person, they could gather their friends. They could either do a book study. They could do a curriculum that the church offered and allow them to do that. Now, not everybody's going to continue. And it may like be, oh, look, we have all these groups. And then you have to offer them a next step. So you like this one? We're going to give you another one and keep going yeah. from there. Seems to me the safest way to start is a really good book, and there's a mm -hmm. lot of good books out there. There are. Um, that's no problem. Because to me, that leader should be one that cares about that person, that cares about their marriage, that cares about their children, that a person can go to knowing that you, you care and you pray, you're going to pray for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs that in their life. Absolutely. And that, that's what a small group can offer. And I'm sorry, we're out of time, but if you just tuned in, I've been talking with Alan White, who has written uh, Expo Exponential Groups. And we've had the website up for a long time. And you know what it is, is just a way to get the body of Christ working the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. And that's... Um, it's horizontal. We try so hard to live everything vertically to God, but he said that we're supposed to be involved with other people. If you love me, you remember when Peter said to, said to Jesus, you love me? Yeah. He didn't say pray 10 hours a day. He said, feed my sheep. It's horizontal and he'll give you the means and the blessing and the direction to do it. We are out of time, but please join me next time. Remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a Homekeepers program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers. 